Welcome to Making a Murderer Rubber Ducky Video Channel. Thank you for joining me today on the RD Making a Murderer Daily Ma'am Reading. We're doing part 72. Page 711. Type of activity released to owner. Date of activity 022406. Reporting Officer Deputy Jeremy Hawkins. On 02-2406, I, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, released to Investigator Rieger approximately eight spiral-bound notebooks and miscellaneous papers with property tag number 8671, and also record documents with property tag number 8670. Also under property tag number 8670 was a cell phone box containing two cell phones. The cell phone box and the two cell phones were kept and placed back into secure storage by myself. Investigator Wiegert signed for the items and took custody of the items. Deputy Jeremy Hawkins, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 712. Type of activity, evidence processing, date of activity 022706, reporting officer, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins. On 02-2706, I, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, went to the secure storage area and got keys to storage unit 1 with property tag number 8039, keys to storage unit number 7, property tag number 8038, and a copy key for the Toyota RAV4, property tag number 8037, out of secure storage. Sheriff Pogel, Investigator Dietering, Sergeant Tyson, and I went to the storage unit where Teresa Hobox's Rep. 4 is being kept. The storage unit where the Rep. 4 is was opened, and Sergeant Tyson and I looked under the front seat of the Rep. 4 for a possible weapon. No weapon was located. The storage unit was then secured. I returned to Calumet County Sheriff's Department where property tag number 8037, the key copied, for the Toyota RAV4, property tag number 8038, two keys for storage unit number 7, and property tag number 8039, keys to storage unit 1, were released to Captain Rush. Captain Rush signed the chain of custody and took custody of the keys. Deputy Jeremy Hawkins, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 713, Type of Activity, Return of Items to Secure Storage, Date of Activity 022806, Reporting Officer, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins. On 022806, I, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, received keys for storage unit number 7, property tag number 8038, keys to storage unit 1, property tag number 8039, of a key, for the Toyota RAV4, property tag number 8037, from Sergeant Tyson. Sergeant Tyson placed the keys into the secure locker, where he then took the key and placed it into secure key locker, where I have the sole key to open the key locker. The property tag numbers with the keys were signed over to me. The keys were then returned to secure storage. Deputy Jeremy Hawkins, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 714, Type of Activity, Arrival of Items, Custody, Date of Activity, 030306, Reporting Officer, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins. On 030306, I, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins, along with Deputy Rick Reamer, Lieutenant Brett Bowie, Sergeant Bill Tyson, Corporal Chris Windorf, and Deputy Joseph M. Tenner unloaded a trailer of items that were seized from the Avery residence. The items were brought down to the main secure storage area where the items were placed into secure storage. The items were then logged in. Deputy Jeremy Hawkins, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 715. Type of activity, release of item, date of activity 030806. Reporting Officer, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins. On 030806, I, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, was asked by Investigator Gary Steyer to release an 8mm videotape, property tag number 8629, to him to view. At this time, the videotape was taken out of secure storage and signed over to Investigator Steyer. 
Once the item was signed over to Investigator Steyer, Investigator Steyer took custody of the 8mm videotape. Deputy Jeremy Hawkins, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 716, Type of Activity, Release of Keys, Date of Activity 031006, Reporting Officer Deputy Jeremy Hawkins. On 031006, I, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, went to the secure storage area and got keys to storage unit number 7, property tag number 8038, and keys to storage unit 1, property tag number 8039. Also taken out of secure storage, were keys to storage unit number 9, property tag number 662. The keys were then taken to the three storage units. I checked each item in the storage units to make sure it was still there for inventory purposes. After inventory was completed, the keys were returned to secure storage by me. Also, on 031006, Deputy Nicholas J. Sablich and I did an inventory of all items pertaining to the Hallbach Avery keys. All items were counted for. Deputy Jeremy Hawkins, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 717, Type of Activity, Return of Evidence, Evidence to Wisconsin State Crime Lab. Date of Activity 031406, Reporting Officer, Deputy Jeremy Hawkins. On 031406, Investigator Gary Steyer returned the 8mm videotape, property tag number 8629. The property was signed over to me and I obtained custody of it and placed it into secure storage. Also on 031406, I got the following items ready for transport to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab in Madison by Special Agent Tom Fassbender. The following items are as follows. Work gloves with what appears to be hair, property tag number 8620. A dried stain swab, property tag number 8637. A controlled swab, property tag number 8635. A controlled swab, property tag number 8633. A controlled swab, property tag number 8636. A controlled swab, property tag number 8641. A controlled swab, property tag number 8632. A dried stain swab, property tag number 8639. A dried stain swab, property tag number 8638. A dried stain swab, property tag number 8640. A dried stain swab, property tag number 8618. Possible hair, property tag number 8634. A dried blood stain property tag number 8622. A blood like substance property tag number 8625. A red substance found in debris pile property tag number 8631. Kitchen paring knife property tag number 8612. Chicago cutlery knife model 61S property tag number 8332. Chicago cutlery knife model 66S property tag number 8382. Chicago Cutlery Knife, Model 65S, Property Tag Number 8330. Knife, Property Tag Number 8383. <clears throat> knife, Eco Stainless Steel, Property Tag Number 8331. Brine Handled Knife, Property Tag Number 8385. A Brown Handled Knife, Property Tag Number 8384. Hair Fibers, Property Tag Number 8341. A hair fiber property tag number 8354. Silver pair of handcuffs property tag number 8267. Silver pair of handcuffs property tag number 8266. Pink fur handcuffs property tag number 8268. Page 718. Pink fur handcuffs property tag number 8269. Red substance property tag number 8617. Box cutter property tag number 8619. Possible hair fiber property tag number 8621. Possible hair property tag number 8624. Bullet fragment property tag number 8623. Bullet fragment property tag number 8607. Brass shell casing property tag number 8626. Brass shell casing property tag number 8614. Brass shell casing property tag number 8608. Brass shell casing property tag number 8616. Bra Brass shell casing property tag number 8615. Brass shell casing property tag number 8609. Bag of debris pile property tag number 8613. 
All items were taken out of secure storage by myself and were given to Special Agent Fassbender after he signed for custody of items. A transmittal form and cover letter was faxed to Special Agent Fassbender before he went to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab in Madison. Deputy Jeremy Hawkins, Calumet County Sheriff's Department. Page 719, Type of Activity Interviews of Keith G. Schaefer, Leonard J. Bouchard, Thomas N. Culp. Date of Activity 03306, Reporting Officer, Investigator Wendy Baldwin. On 03306, at approximately 1400 hours, Investigator John Dietering and I, Investigator Wendy Baldwin, arrived at Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry in the city of Manitowoc to follow up with several rumors that had been going around the Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry plant. I received information that a foreman by the name of Keith Schaefer had overheard comments made by Scott Tadich about the Avery case. At approximately 1428 hours, I made contact with Keith G. Schaefer, date of birth 11-11-54, in a conference room located at the Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry plant. Keith informed me he had been an employee with Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry for several years. Keith has known Scott Tadich for approximately eight to nine years. I asked Keith if he could explain some of the rumors that Scott Tadich had been saying to certain people at the plant. Keith went on to say he had been hearing Scott Tadich telling some of the workers in the plant about information on the Teresa Halbach murder homicide investigation. Keith had heard that Scott had not shown up for work on 103105. However, he had heard he went to see his mother in the hospital. Scott had been telling page 720 people he had seen the fire on Halloween by Stephen Avery and Scott or the other people had made it sound like he had gotten out of the vehicle and actually talked to Stephen by the fire. Keith also heard from other guys that Scott had noticed stains on the pants and shirts of one of Barbara's kids. Keith also recalled the day Brendan was arrested. Barbara had called Scott at work, and he had gone outside to talk to her. Keith does remember that he has received several received phone calls several times while he was at work. Scott had also told people that Brendan knew something more than what he had been telling the police. Keith had said Scott was very protective of Brendan, perhaps because of his learning disabilities. Keith provided a few more names of people that associate with Scott at work and thought they may be of assistance with Scott, had been telling people. Keith described Scott as being very edgy lately, short-tempered, angry person. Keith said he is a chronic liar and does not really get along with a lot of people at the plant and would never know when he would blow up at somebody. Keith said Scott also screams a lot and said he was, quote, a psycho. Keith felt Scott also knew more about the murder than he had told people, and Keith felt Scott could be very capable of the murder and knowing or knowing something more. Keith said his relationship with Barbara seems to be okay. However, because of the case, he did seem disturbed by what was going on. Keith said after Stephen was arrested, Scott had thought it had been a setup and that he was framed. However, a week later, Scott did not believe this anymore and thought Stephen was guilty. I provided Keith with a business card and informed him if he heard any more to contact me or the Sheriff's Department. The interview was concluded at approximately 15.04 hours. Interview of Thomas N. Culp On 03306, at approximately 15.06 hours, Investigator Dietering and I made contact with Thomas M. Culp, date of birth 021579. Thomas informed us that he has known Scott Tadich for approximately 7 to 10 years. He had had overheard and was also told by Scott he was at Stephen Avery's house the night of the fire. Thomas said he took it as though Scott was standing by the fire with Stephen. Thomas said Scott had told him that Stephen always has fires at his house. I asked Thomas how this information or the discussion had come about talking about the case, and he said Scott would just freely and voluntarily give up the information out of the blue. Thomas said, however, right after Stephen was arrested, Scott had believed that Stephen... Alrighty, let's do our review starting on page 711. I'm very confused by the type of activity released to owner. So how can anybody own the evidence, property tags, in this case? And it's implying that Uyghur owns all of this, and I don't get that. 
um, Investigator Weger approximately eight spiral-bound notebooks and miscellaneous papers with property tag number 8671. Also, record documents with property tag number 8670. Then, it talks about 8670 being uh, a cell phone box. So, record documents and a cell phone box with two cell phones. Hmm. How can he be the owner of that? Is he handing it back to an owner? Anyway, he signed for these items and took custody of the items, but the type of activity is listed as release to owner, which makes zero sense to me in this case. What's new, right? So we're going to jump to 712. <clears throat> now, Brendan's interview was 3-2 and or 3-1-3-2, so March 1st and 2nd. And he talked um, with them, and they had fed him the information about um, possibly stabbing her in the stomach and all this kind of stuff. But here we are on the 27th of February, which is days before, um, and they're looking under the front seat of the Rev4 for the possible weapon that Brendan is going to be telling them about that was supposedly underneath the seat of the Rav. Hmm. So apparently Brendan and them have been talking or they've got this idea way ahead before they've talked to Brendan, one or the other. Um, but the timeline of March 1st and 2nd where Brendan's saying um, that Stephen has stabbed Teresa in the stomach with a knife and that he has stored the knife under the seat in the wrath. Um, apparently they already knew about this whole scenario, um, this version of the story prior because this is the 27th. 27th of February. So I think that's interesting. And uh, it's interesting also that he signs out a copy for the Toyota RAV4 key as well as the key to the storage unit on the 27th of February. Huh. But we don't see it signed back in that day. It's a whole day later. So overnight, somebody had the key to the storage unit where the RAV is. And they weren't put back until the 28th. Mm-hmm. Nice. Now we're going to do quite a bit of a jump um, to page 717, Return of Evidence, Evidence to Wisconsin State Crime Lab. Just a couple things. Here's that number 8637 that we're missing, that was missing in yesterday's report. So at least they do have it on this one. This is all going to be transported by Tom Fassbender. Now, remember, Fassbender is the one that made the note to Sherry Colhane, the lab tech that said, put her in the garage. Try to put her in the house or the garage. And um, hello. Hi, it's Karen. Your recently issued loan qualification will be canceled if we don't hear from you today. You're pre-approved for a lower monthly payment as well as loan forgiveness. We've tried a number of times to reach you with no success. Press five now to speak to a specialist before your pre-approval. Hi, I'm interested about student loan forgiveness. Well, I, I didn't have a loan, but I took one out so you guys could help me with it because you guys call me every day, so I went and got one. Okay, let's rejoin this. Sorry about that interruption. 718, put her in the garage. Okay, that implies that the person has the option to put somebody anywhere. You're a lab tech. You can't put anybody in any position if you're doing your job right. You simply test the item and give the results. Wherever the results lay, that's where they lay. But <clears throat> Fassbender is the one that wants her put in the garage. What What is he getting? The bullet fragments, 8623 and 8607. Interesting, right? That's what I thought. Now, we're going to jump to 719, which is the interview at the Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry. Now, we only get to talk to two people in this, this episode, but tomorrow we'll get to finish up. Very, very interesting. So, Keith Schaefer is who we're talking to, and he's known Scott Tadish about eight or nine years. Um, and he goes on to say 
that as far as he had heard, Scott had not shown up for the 31st. We all know this. Um, according to him, he had heard that Scott had went to see his mother in the hospital, which we know is not true. So we jump to our last page of the day, which is 720. And he's making it very clear that under his understanding that either Scott or other people have made it sound like Scott actually got out of the vehicle and is standing by the fire talking to Stephen that night. Um, and Scott's the one that seems to be bringing up that he noticed stains on pants and shirts on Barb's kids. Are you kidding me? Stains on your kids' clothes. That's a big deal when you live at a salvage yard? For real? Well, according to him, Scott is a chronic liar and does not really get along with a lot of people at the plant. Surprise, surprise. He also states you never know when he will blow up and that, quote unquote, he believes Scott is a, quote, psycho. He also felt that Scott could be very capable of murder or knowing something more. He's known him a long time. That's a very strong statement to say to a police officer is that I feel this individual is capable of murder. Hmm. And then we go on to the little bit we got to touch on, on Thomas Culp. And it was him, or he had overheard, um, and he was also told by Scott that Scott was at Stephen Avery's house the night of the fire. So he didn't make it, he didn't say that Scott told him, oh, I was over at my girlfriend's, picked her up, and could see over at Scott, over at Stevens. He has told this gentleman, or this gentleman is reporting, I should say, that Scott was at Stephen Avery's house the night of the fire. So he said, he took it as though Scott was standing by the fire with Stephen. Very interesting review today. And I thank you for that. Sorry about that um, phone call, but I can no longer just quit doing what I'm doing to pick up these phone calls and then restart. And so I thought I'd share you how we're going to handle these interruptions when they are. Obviously, I've never had a student loan in my life. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. All right, you guys. That was part 72 of the Daily Mam reading. Um, you know, Scott Tadich, he, he, oh, boy, he really is... Um, he has no alibi. He actually, the confusion for me isn't that a person doesn't have an alibi. It's when they provide a false alibi that's the problem. And when you provide a false alibi in a murder, the problem is, what were you doing that is so bad or so incriminating that you cannot reveal what you actually were doing? That's my problem. And then you have his coworkers and his supervisors all commenting on how, you know, he he is his volunteering all this information and at the time at work he's making it, Scott's making it sound like he was actually at Stevens that night. Very interesting. So you guys, it's time. If you didn't do the crime, you shouldn't do the time. And this is true. This is a very true statement. It is so sad that these two individuals didn't do a thing wrong. And yet, here they are, missing all these years of their lives. Not even getting a childhood for, for Brendan. It's just ridiculous. If you would like to watch um, some information about all about the blood in the case, Dr. Silkman has this presentation available for you. And that's on our channel as well. Also, we have other videos such as the 12 Days of Murder. We do talk about the Christine Marie Rudy, Carmen Marie Botwell, and Teresa Marie Hobbach, all with Marie as the middle name. We'll go into a little bit of detail there. But I want to thank you each for all of your support on Brendan and Stephen's case, as well as to our channel. And I hope that you have a wonderful day.